Hey, this is Christian Buckley with another MVP Buzz Chat, and I have the pleasure of interviewing a dual MVP and fellow Microsoft Regional Director, Tobias. Hey, good good evening for you. Hey, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's indeed the evening, uh, rather late evening right now, uh, but still very happy to have you. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. Well, why don't you introduce yourself, like who you are, where you are, and what you do. Yeah, uh, my name is Tobias Fenster, as you just said. I'm uh, from Germany, actually southern Germany. So the, the two bigger cities that are nearer that you might have heard of is uh, Munich and Stuttgart. So we're kind of in between in a smaller city. That's where I actually grew up. I uh, didn't, didn't travel for a long time uh, for far away. And actually, it's always been the same place that I've been staying. Traveled a lot for work, of course, but that's, that's my home, um, basically. Um, I have a family of two small kids and uh, on the business side, as you already said, I'm a, a dual Microsoft MVP, both for business applications and for Azure. Started off on the business application side and as that more and more moved towards Azure, I, I did more things on Azure. Uh, the company I work for started to move into the Azure direction and so it was kind of a natural progression that that, that came up. And then uh, last year, I had the great honor and also a bit of a surprise that I was accepted as a regional director. So I'm, I'm fairly new to that program as well. Well, it, it, excellent. It's great to have you. And, and I, was, I have to say, so my, the first time I was visiting a client down in Stuttgart in the, mm -hmm. auto, uh, the auto industry, mm -hmm. and I was uh, somebody caught wind that I was going to be in the area, and I ended up speaking to the user group there at one of, it wasn't, I, I'm thinking it, it it wasn't an auto museum. I think it was like a storage facility, like okay. beautiful glass walls, mm -hmm. you know, with very expensive cars. And the conference room was upstairs with glass looking out on all these beautiful vehicles everywhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it, so that was my first visit to the region. I've been down two or three other times, but okay. it, it's, it's a beautiful part of the country down there. Yeah, it really automotive is the weird part. You have uh, Daimler, uh, so Mercedes, and you have Porsche, uh, basically the same city. And then like 250 kilometers away, there is BMW, and then Audi is, is also not far away. So that's really, it's really an automotive region overall. Yep. Well, it's great. Well, so let's kind of dive in. The things that I know that you're very active in the community. No, None of us are traveling and, and, and other plans. I think I saw that it's like, you're not, uh, hopeful about doing any in-person events for the rest of the calendar year. <laughs> I, you know, I think it's a good strategy, but I think it's realistic for a lot of regions. Um, but what are the kinds of things that you're actively talking about, presenting about, writing about? Yeah, so on the, on the business application side, I'm uh, mostly working with Business Central. Um, I'm coming from a Business Central background like the last 10 years. And the company that I now work for, Cosmo Consult, is, is also having a broader spectrum. So I've, I've started to look into FNSCM and customer engagement and power apps and so on. But really, my, my strongest background is on Business Central. So that's what I'm writing about, but really not on the functional side. I'm very much on the technical side. So things like Docker containers, I kind of was on the, on the forefront when those got um, established on the BC Central, uh, on the Business Central side. That's where I'm writing a lot about um, Azure DevOps as a tooling platform. I've done a lot in the last couple of years. And then because I am um, started my career as a developer, um, also Visual Studio Code and um, Dev containers and that kind of thing that's more on the on the development side. And then, yeah, of course, also Azure related things, um, automation mostly. Um, I'm I really, uh, that's one of the not so, um, let's say unusual mantras, but something that I really, really like to think about a lot is everything that can be automated should be automated. Of course, always there are limits even to that, but that's really something that I strongly believe in and uh, I really hate to do things twice. So um, it's my own, my own inspiration and also a lot of the benefits that I can see. So I'm, I'm also talking and um, sharing about that. So I know that you, so you're also, you have in your profile, so you talk about, uh, you know, working with Dynamics Nav. I, I you know, I, don't, I think you're the first person I've interviewed through this series and you're like number 112, I think, <laughs> that has done anything on the ERP side. I mean, that, that used to be a little bit of my past world that it's just, it hasn't been in 20 plus years. Um, is it that long? Yeah, <laughs> almost. It's thinking back. Wow. 
uh, oh, oh, not not quite that. So 16 years since I was in that that space, but working with high tech manufacturing companies mm -hmm. and trying to automate a lot of that manufacturing mm -hmm. and the collaboration. That's how actually how I moved into the collaboration space was okay. working with manufacturing companies mm -hmm. and taking the very uh, uh, process centric. Uh, uh, you know, the, the manufacturing process, helping them to halt that manufacturing mm -hmm. process, do a redesign, mm -hmm. a rejigger something about it, and then, uh, you know, understand the impacts of the design changes, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. collaborate uh, around that change, and then restart that process. And it's a, I mean, it's fascinating from a, you know, technology and automation standpoint. Yeah. But like I said, I've, I've not been paying attention to as much to that mm -hmm. sector you know, in the last 15 plus years, but yeah. what, what's kind of going on in, from a Microsoft perspective uh, around that side? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the big story, of course, is that NAV has, has done a major rehaul around 2009, between 2009, 2010, 2011, something like that. They went from the old technology stack to a three-tier architecture, SQL Server as a backend. So that's, that's now in, in IT terms already ancient history, but that was a big change. And then in recent years, they moved from, um, again, the old development style, having CL as a programming language and an integrated development environment into Visual Studio Code. So that's now really a, a modern state-of-the-art environment. Um, when I first joined the NAV world and they showed me how all of this works and there was no version control, you had to write comments when you wanted to track changes, you had to right. manually extend the database size. And, and I actually came from a Java world using Eclipse and tool -like, tools like that. And I was, okay, you're kidding, right? That, that, that can't possibly be how you're doing professionally, uh, professional development. So that, that was really something where I was always torn. You know, you saw the progress. And then it was something like 2015 or 2016 when they showed, okay, now we have autocomplete in the, in the IDE. And I was like, you know, it's nice, but maybe 10 years too late. So it, it really felt good that they, they made a big step forward in the last couple of years. And if you now look at the landscape, I think uh, BC is really in a good position and, and working with modern technology. As I said, they, they picked up um, Docker containers as a, as a mechanism relatively early. Um, are strongly pushing that one. Then Visual Studio Code is, is really my personal favorite environment, even if I'm not doing Business Central stuff uh, or instead anything else, I still uh, tend to use Visual Studio Code. So I'm very happy with that decision. So yeah, I, I really think um, since outgrowing NAV and, and going into Business Central, a lot of good things have happened to the, um, to the technology stack there. Well, you just reminded me of uh, uh, you know the talking about the, the the way of doing you know source code management. I at the beginning of my career, I was a tech writer and uh, a business uh, analyst, mm -hmm. and part of my role uh, working for a consulting company in California um, was to work with the engineering team to make sure I documented all of the changes mm -hmm. and go in and add them to the comments. Comments, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and then the paper, that was just still paper-based documentation. And then update the binders. That was a lot of fun. It was a great job. Uh, I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Th things have really changed a lot around that. Well, it's it's interesting. I, I, I think broadly looking across the dynamic space, again, I've not been as familiar with what's been happening outside of the Dynamics 365 you know, side of things um, that you know for a while, just things were so quiet. And we used to question whether Microsoft was really taking seriously, like what's actually happening with these other brands and the acquisitions Microsoft made in that space. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so what kind of, what's changing? What's, you know, what what's kind of driving the growth that's happening now? Yeah, I mean, if you look at it just like a few years back, you had the um, Accepta or AX world, you had NAV, uh, Navision, and then you had um, Great Plains and you had Solomon. So it, it was really, not easy to understand where Microsoft was going. Then they had things like Project Green, where it seemed like they want to move to one platform. Then um, actually the first time that I went to a big conference in, in North America, um, the, the head of Business Central, or at that time NAV came up and basically said, okay, uh, the, the NAV is a thing of the past. We're only offering white label anymore. And there was a big uproar and they had to reverse that decision. And it, as far as I know, that, that also was a, a tough one for a lot of people inside Microsoft. But Nowadays, it looks like um, the, the GP people are more and more mo moving over to um, Business Central. 
And also uh, Solomon, I'm not seeing a lot of that anymore. Of course, AX has moved into finance and supply chain management. So that's, right. that's a big thing, but it looks like it has stabilized around those two offerings, finance and supply chain management on the one side and business central on the other side. And you're hearing some discussions, when is what the right solution? Do we need to put in some limitations like uh, above that number of users, it's always finance and supply chain management. Below that number of users, it's always business central. But yeah. fortunately, it's it's dying down, that, that kind of discussion. At least I'm hearing less of that. And it's really, let's look at the customer, find out what they need, and then make a decision based on that. Because there are small customers who are happy with uh, FNSCM, and there are big customers who are happy with business central. And it, it looks like they're finding a way to, to keep that... Um, separated and, and partners are finding their niche and it seems to work for everyone. So what kinds of, uh, uh, of, of questions are you hearing? What, what are the, the major discussions that are happening out in the, uh, you know, the customer base now? It's always interesting to look at, see what kinds of questions are coming in, what kind of projects that partners are being asked to go and do that gives you a, you know, kind of a pulse on the changes that are happening and kind of the movement of the market. So what's, what, what's kind of happening in the market? I mean, the, the big change, of course, is the cloud, um, especially on Business Central, as you said, manufacturing, that's at least for my company, a, a big focus, we're basically doing a lot of different industries, but that's, that's one of the core industries. And there you have a lot of traditional companies, maybe with, with leaders who are like 50, 60, coming from a different age of IT, and that, that is not a fault at all, but they are somewhat reluctant to move into, um, into a more modern world, into a cloud world, and also regionally speaking, as we're working across Europe and, and also uh, in Latin and Asia, there, there's clearly a tendency to move quicker. For example, in Sweden, we see a lot more cloud adoption. In France, we see a lot more cloud adoption, and the, the German-speaking countries are somewhat slower to, to move on. But still, that's, that's, of course, the big topic, understanding why SaaS is a good idea, understanding why that's a benefit for the customer, uh, moving to a subscription-based model, moving into a full SaaS environment. That's, that's really the big topics. And, and then since lately, of course, um, digitization is a big thing. We actually have that as our, as our company mission and vision for like four or five years. So we've been kind of on the forefront of that one, but it, it really has picked up um, pace in the last couple of years. And um, the whole SaaS story also picked up pace because we've seen some more security incidents, you know, around ransomware and that kind of thing. And more and more people come to the realization, do I really think I can do a better job than Microsoft uh, securing my data? Do I really think I can responsibly say, okay, I have those two people, they are amazingly talented and they are gonna keep my, my data center up and running and secure. And, and that has also created a push where we see a lot of yeah, interest in moving to the cloud. Well, yeah, it's, uh, I know that um, you know, my, Microsoft, of course, even back when Bomber was still in the company, um, was just you know cloud everything cloud pushing organizations towards that and I think they were really surprised at the pushback that happened mm -hmm. and the, at the uh, the resilience of the uh, uh, well on on prem not so much because I think those numbers are changing it is accelerating as people you know build up that trust when they start to realize hey I can turn more of this over to Microsoft to these cloud providers. And it is as good or better than my two security guys can do on their own. Um, but that the but the hybrid story has really been something that is uh, has been a lot bigger than Microsoft anticipated. Do you see that? Are more organizations they're comfortable with that within uh, within your primary market? Uh, is is there a major difference between what you're seeing from a from a hybrid standpoint in in Germany, or do you still see a lot of on prem? Yeah, we actually the the biggest part of the customer base is still on prem, um, but if you look at new customers that are coming in, they are definitely asking what is your cloud story, and even a majority is is asking um, I, I only only want a cloud offering. And as I said, in in other countries in Europe, we see basically a hundred percent of the new customers going to the cloud. Um, in Germany, it's a bit slower, but but also it's picking up speed. And um, as you say, hybrid is an interesting topic because we still have areas that are not perfectly connected to the internet. So that, that can become an issue, especially if you wanna run your, your shop floor or um, 
I don't know, your production area or something like that through the cloud and you have a bad integration and then uh, your production is stopped for half an hour because your integration, uh, your, your connection has a problem. That is, of course, something that you want to provide at any uh, or prevent at any cost. So that is an interesting story. Also, the, the whole IoT story where you can see, okay, it might make sense to have something still on-prem very close to my sensors, very close to uh, where I have my data. And then maybe the financial data can be synced into the cloud. Um, and I still have one, one environment, but basically the data is synced here. And then I can use Power BI. And um, what we're also doing is something called intelligent ERP. So we have an AI component that is taking financial data, making um, predictions about the future, and then putting it back into the ERP system. So things like that, that there's always an, an, a hybrid part of that. And it still allows the customer to have a feel good environment that that the, the core data is still on prem and it's secure in their data center whether that's factually true or it's just emotionally true but but it's it's still an argument well i know with a lot of the the supply chain uh, uh you know solutions that were out there kind of in general they uh you know even as they were embracing the the cloud, it was still a dedicated cloud environment. They didn't trust anything outside of that network, but they had some layers and some controls over, and which made it really difficult for the very large tier one, tier two suppliers that had multiple OEM relationships and having to plug into each one of those, those, those environments is just more work, more cost for them. Uh, yeah. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, obviously I think it, uh, I, I used to always say that, uh, uh, that, uh, I do envision the future that you know everything will be moving towards the cloud. I'm just and then I throw in my caveat, which is I don't know if it'll be within my lifetime. <laughs> uh, I mean, just the it, and and that's why you had Microsoft even being very careful with their wording about supporting um, technologies, you know, yeah. on-prem and hybrid as well, and removing yeah. like uh, you're trying to fight hard against the perceptions that there was some end of life date on yeah. the, these products. And Microsoft is like, look, we're in the business to make money. Our customers are asking for it. They're demand, they're not moving off this. We'll continue providing it as long as financially it makes sense. And it's it's too big. You know, what's it, the hard part is that Microsoft doesn't like to talk about um, the, the uh, you know, those that are still on-prem or in, in hybrid because their focus and what their sellers are man, you know, uh, measured on are all the cloud components. Yeah. And yeah, then it makes absolutely. it difficult to really understand. It, it, there needs to be, I know, I need to go and do some research again around the size, the scope of what still remains. Even Satya in his latest, the announcements, the stuff around Microsoft Viva and all that talked about, we're in this second wave of digital transformation. It's still these remnant on-prem. And this, I still believe, I don't know anymore. I mean, the SharePoint space, they're still... You know, I'd say over 50% that are still hybrid environments. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a number, but all three years ago, three and a half years ago, it was over 70%. Mm -hmm. yep. And we have the data on that one. Yeah. So in yeah. three years, I think it's accelerated, but it's still clearly over 50%. I don't know how that translates. That's SharePoint world, how that translates into, uh, you know, the other areas. But I just, I think it's uh, a lot bigger than Microsoft is, you know, talking about there, and they're they're yeah. focused on the future. But yeah. for partners, for for us, especially RDs and MVPs that are still answering customers' questions and trying to devise the right solutions for them, which may not be a pure cloud solution. You know, anyway, yeah. There's yeah, um, there there was a Gartner study. It was like I think two or three years ago, but they predicted that even in in 2025, even uh, two thirds of the ERP space would still be on-prem. So yeah. if you look at growth rates, that's absolutely cloud, cloud, cloud. Um, there, there's no way the ERP business is growing on-prem, but still there's two thirds that are still on-prem. And, and that's also what I'm talking about when people ask me, I mean, do, do you think the, the on-prem business will be stopped? Do you think they will stop support, supporting the on-prem versions? And I always say, they're not gonna cut off the two thirds of the market just for the fun of it. 
right. mean, will they run promotions? No. Will they make it cheaper? No. Will they talk about it in, in fancy events? No, certainly not. But I absolutely don't see them cutting it off because it's it's just a huge part of the market. Yeah, they, they can't. Yeah, it's I mean, the reality is net new customers that are new starting up, everybody's, you know, they're, they're all born in the cloud. They're moving towards that direction. It wouldn't make sense for them to do anything otherwise. But for the, the folks, especially like me, you know, the middle-aged people that have been working in this space for a long time, there is going to be plenty of opportunity for the old technology or the old ways of doing things, as well as the cloud, uh, certainly for the rest of my career. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's yeah. not going to go anywhere that quickly, but yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'm personally, I'm, I'm really. Um, I really like to be on the edge of things, trying new stuff, and, and basically everything around that is happening in the cloud. So I'm. I'm personally really drawn to the cloud. But absolutely, if you look at the daily business about the challenges that are there, there, there's a long time, um, and that we still need to at least support, but also to a degree move forward cloud customers, even if you're mostly forward forward working into the cloud, but. Uh, it's not going to go away well, soon. If it, yeah, if you if you're looking for you know customer opportunities, you need to be able to work in both both sides of things yeah. and, and do the right thing. That's the right solution for your your customers. And there's only so Absolutely. much that you can push cloud in an organization that just uh, is just like look, we we still not you know uh, paid off our investments that we made in this last version, and it works. It provides what we need and. And, and and so they've got a longer plan to to move off that. Um, so yeah, it there's there's tons of opportunity out there. Um, you know, so plenty to do. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, yeah. definitely, that's for sure. Well, Tobias, really, really appreciate your your time today. So people want to find out more about you. What's what are the best ways for them to find you and to reach out and connect with you? Yeah, I do blog on uh, TobiasFenster.io. That's my my homepage and where, where I blog. I try to put up something new every month, something like that. And then I'm also quite active on Twitter, not so much on LinkedIn, but um, basically the usual uh, the usual things. I, I didn't go into the video uh, game and uh, like having an own channel or things like you are doing. Yeah. I, I like watching it a lot, yours and others, but um, I, I, I've not started something like that. So it's more the so to speak, traditional things that, that weren't there five years ago, but now it feels like the traditional stuff. <laughs> well, you know, when you have the benefit, like I just you know, started up with uh, my, so my new company with, with AppPoint, they have a fantastic marketing team. It does a lot of stuff. So I'm going to be doing a, a lot less through my channel now that I have a team that does so much of that kind of stuff for me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I know what you mean. It, 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 there's a lot of work involved. <laughs> I guess so. I can yeah. imagine. Well, really, really appreciate the time to uh, to connect, and uh, hopefully next year we'll get to uh, uh, hang out, connect uh, in person at uh, the MVP and RD summits. That would be great. Thanks for having me. All right. Talk to you soon. Talk to you. Bye.